Welcome to this lecture, which is a part of a larger lecture series on climate change and psychology. My name is Thomas Lehechka, and I'm a researcher in linguistics, currently associated with the Obo Academy University in Finland. This lecture is about persuasion, or in other words, communicating in a way that makes people change their opinions and attitudes, and by doing so, also potentially changing their behavior. So, basically, persuasion is about trying to influence others, not by using force or setting limits to what is allowed, but by influencing a person's mindset and their way of thinking about things, which then makes them act in a certain way out of their own free will. People often feel that persuasion is something negative. I mean, it does have some a bit negative connotations, right? It may conjure some negative thoughts in your mind um, when you think about situations where persuasion is typically taking place. Maybe it makes you think about commercials, where people are trying to sell you things you don't actually need. Or maybe you're thinking about your boss trying to convince you to work on a holiday or uh, do something that's not really a part of your job description. Or maybe you're like me uh, right now thinking about uh, the time when somebody got you to lend them some money even though you knew that they are unreliable and you were pretty sure they are never going to pay you back and they never did. Well, anyway, most people associate persuasion with negative experiences. But looking at it objectively, what those negative experiences actually show is that persuasion works. I mean, they show that communication can be a very powerful tool to influence someone's mind. Also, you have to remember that persuasion can be used for good in the same way as it can be used for the bad. It can be used to increase positive behavior, meaning behavior that benefits the individual that's being persuaded, and make them think or act in a way that is good for them and at the same time also good for other people. And this is the type of persuasion that we will be focusing on in this lecture. And I'll give quite a few examples of persuasion being used for making positive changes in people's behavior. In the context of climate change, of course, the the ultimate goal is to preserve the planet in a state that is, well, habitable, basically, and, you know, just agreeable, really, in terms of the climatic conditions uh, for humans and for other animals and other organisms. So, really, it's hard to find a reason for persuasion that is more positive than that. And it's safe to say that there is a great need for this kind of persuasion because, well, we know that we have to change our behavior and we've known this already for a long time, but in general, we haven't been making changes that are big enough or fast enough. So we need a lot more persuasion to achieve these goals. And so what we'll do in this lecture is that we'll look at what current research in social psychology, linguistics, and uh, communication science says about how to influence others in an effective way. Um, before we get down to the nitty gritty of the topic, um, I just want to say a few words about the format of this lecture. So, first of all, this is a whiteboard lecture, uh, meaning that I will be making notes and illustrating my points on the whiteboard 
while keeping myself out of view. Um, I do this um, being inspired by various science podcasts I listen to, as well as uh, recent conversations on Clubhouse, where you also can't see who you're actually talking to. You can't see the person who is talking, but you can actually feel really connected with the people you hear, often much more so than what you do when you have a Zoom speaker window on your screen and uh, you see a person there talking to nobody in particular, really. Um, second, uh, you shouldn't just listen to this lecture passively, but also do some active work. And what I mean by that is mostly thinking. So really the hardest work of all. So over the course of the lecture, I will be asking you some questions, which I hope you will think about and um, that you will actually take the time to think about. So I will ask you to pause the video every now and then and jot down your thoughts and reactions uh, to the question before continuing with the video. These will always be just very short breaks, um, a minute or two or so, so um, nothing overwhelming at all. But please take these breaks. I promise you that you will get more out of the lecture that way. So have a pen and paper ready or a notepad uh, on your computer or you know, if uh, you're listening to this on a beach, you can write in sand with your finger. I don't care. It doesn't really matter as long as you can write something down to structure your thoughts. Okay, so after this long introduction, um, let's start with the actual lecture. As a matter of fact, um, I'd like to start right away by asking you a question. So get ready to do some thinking now. And the question is, if you had five minutes to persuade someone about something, what would you say? So just as a thought exercise, really imagine that you had just five minutes to talk to someone that you'd like to persuade about something. If you knew that you have just a very limited amount of time to change someone's mind, where you'd have to make every second count and also um, every word count, what would you say? Think about this for a bit and write down just um, your spontaneous thoughts and reactions to this question. They don't even necessarily have to be direct answers to the question if you don't come up with any. Just write down any spontaneous thoughts that the question makes you think of. So you should pause the video here for a minute or so and uh, then press play again when you're ready. Okay, so if you're anything like most people, you probably found it pretty hard to answer the question. Maybe you were thinking about what tactics to use when trying to persuade someone, like uh, what emotions you could appeal to, and whether it is better to use scare tactics, for example, or whether it is better to focus on the intrinsic value of things. Or maybe you were thinking about what facts you would present in your argument. But I'm pretty sure that your main reaction was the feeling of, oh my god, this is impossible, I have no idea where to begin, or 
it totally depends on the situation. The problem is that the question is too vague, right? It's really not specific enough so that one could give a specific answer to it. And that's really the point I wanted to make here. There is no universal correct answer to this question. The answer will always depend on the specifics of the situation. You need to know more about the situation to be able to decide what to say. So this leads us logically to the next question. What are all the things you would need to know about the situation in order to be able to decide what you would say? And this time I'm actually expecting you to come up with some answers. So, so think about this on your own for a couple of minutes. What are all the factors that would affect your choice of what to say when persuading someone? So pause the video here again and write down some thoughts about this. And after you feel like you're done, press play again. So let's see. What would we need to know about the situation in order to be able to decide what we should say? I'm going to uh, switch canvases here and formulate the question just a tiny bit shorter so it doesn't take as much space. So another way to say the same thing, what do we need to know in order to know what to say? Well, there are lots of things. The thing that people usually think about first is who it is we are persuading. So who is the recipient of the message? And I'm going to illustrate the recipients by this picture of a couple of individuals grouped together. So obviously, who we are talking to affects what we say. We talk differently to our family members than to a stranger on the street. And the more we know about the individuals who we are talking to, like what their opinions are and what their attitudes are and what kind of personalities they have, the more we can target our message to them specifically. Okay, great. So what else do we need to know about the situation in order to choose the right thing to say? Well, the context or the setting of the situation is important too. So there's a big difference between how we can persuade someone in a face-to-face -face conversation in comparison with making a video about something or tweeting, let's say. For example, uh, in the current context, I'm giving a video lecture so that affects what I can do and say right now, partly because of the technical limitations of the situation and partly because of the expectations that come with this context. Uh, I will use this drawing of a building uh, to symbolize the context here. So this looks a bit like it could be a university building with the pillars and all. But really, the building doesn't only symbolize the physical setting, but also the larger context, like what kind of a society do we live in and what types of behavior are customary or dominant in that society. So. The context here covers a lot of different things on different levels. Okay, so what else do we need to know? Well, the most 
trivial factor, perhaps, is that we need to know what it is that we are trying to persuade someone about. We need to know what the message is that we're trying to get across, right? And this is, of course, a very obvious, like, yeah, sure, what we say depends always on the topic we want to talk about. I'm going to use uh, this thought bubble to represent the intentional message in persuasion. So if we are trying to sell someone a car, we'll probably come up with nice things to say about that car. But if we want to convince someone to go to the movies with us, talking about the car uh, won't probably be very relevant. And the same applies also within the topic of climate change. We would say different things depending on whether we want to make someone accept the science on climate change or whether we, we or whether we want them to switch to energy saving light, light bulbs, you know, or whether we want them to come plant trees with us. So the topic of what we want to persuade people about is key, but it's not the only key, as we're going to see from the studies we look at in this lecture. And I will come back to the issue of topic and message towards the end of this lecture again, but we'll actually discuss the other factors in, in more detail first. And the reason I do this is that those factors also affect the topics that we can or should choose to talk about. Okay, so now we have the recipient and we have the context and the message. So is there still something else we need to know about the situation before deciding what we are going to say? Well, there's at least one more factor and it's a factor that people usually don't think about as spontaneously, maybe, as, as the other ones here, because it might seem almost too obvious, I guess. But you'll notice that there is something missing from this drawing. So we have the context and the message and the recipient, but something is missing. Uh, I mean, the thought bubble sort of gives, gives it away a bit. Uh, so. Who does the thought bubble belong to? In other words, there has to be someone who does the persuasion. The person who, the person who wants to persuade us about something. So the source of the message. Even if it's we ourselves who are doing the persuasion, we should be aware, at least subconsciously, of who we are in a given situation. Now, I know, I, I know this can sound like a bit pseudo-scientific when you say it like this, or, or maybe it sounds like something I just took from a self-help book. <laughs> but what I mean here specifically is that who we are has a great influence on what we can say in a given situation, as well as on how persuasive our message will be to our audience. It's important to, do, to notice that who we are is at least partly defined through the context in which we find ourselves in. So to use the current context as an example, the reason you're watching this video is because you're either taking a class on climate change and psychology, or you're other, otherwise looking for lectures on the subject. In either case, you have, a certain, you have certain expectations about how lectures work. And in this context of lectures, you probably expect that there is a so-called expert on the subject uh, telling you something and you listen and possibly learn something from that. 
So it is through this context that I am assigned my role as a lecturer. And this gives me a sort of a stage to try to influence you from, in a, in a positive sense, of course. And in the same way, the, the context also defines your role as recipients. And of course, the context also partly defines the message that I'm expected to communicate to you. So there's really like a big interplay between the factors. They are affecting each other in different ways. Good. Okay, so I think we have a pretty good first sketch here now um, uh, regarding the different factors that are at play in persuasion. So what we are going to do now is to look in a bit more detail at these factors and look at the examples of studies that show what types of effects these factors might, might have on communicating about climate change specifically. So let's start with the last factor that we added to the drawing, so the source of the message. I'm sure you can think of some person you know who you think is very good at persuading. I think we all know people who are like especially charismatic and good at making us feel in a, a feel a certain way. Now, I wish I could tell you that persuasion is all about, you know, your qualification and your expertise, but probably deep down you already know that it's not. Uh, basically, persuasion starts at the very superficial level of looks. So if you are good looking, you have a better chance of persuading someone than if you're not. And there is a huge body of research showing this effect. Uh, for example, Judith Langlois and her colleagues at the University of Austin, Texas, um, they did a massive meta-study on the effects of attractiveness on how people are perceived by others. So a meta-study is a study that collects together the findings from a large number of individual studies made by others over the course of several years or even decades. Well, in this study, they found, among other things, that attractive people are both perceived and treated more positively than unattractive people. So if an attractive person does something or says something, this act tends to be perceived more positively than if a less attractive person does or says the same thing. This is known in psychology as the halo effect, which you probably know, um, where a positive judgment about one characteristic of a person, in this case their looks, has a positive impact on the judgment of their other characteristics as well. So being good looking really is a great advantage if you want people to perceive you positively. And if they do that, then of course, it is also, also easier for you to make others listen to what you're saying. And if they do that, you have, a, you have a better chance of persuading them of your point of view. You can also find this effect in the world of politics, which uh, really like uh, politics is the, is the great playing field of persuasion, right? I mean, a, a, large, a large part of what politicians do is try to persuade voters to vote for them. And of course, you would sort of hope that the people with the best ideas and the best arguments get the most votes. But there is a fair amount of research indicating that good-looking candidates have a substantial advantage and that they get more votes in elections than what less attractive candidates do, even if their policy positions are the same. 
So even though we probably wish that it weren't like that, physical attributes like our looks and our voice play a large part in persuasion. But apart from our physical attributes, what also contributes to the persuasiveness of a source and what also makes up who we are is also what we know. And maybe even more importantly, what our role or position is in society. So people higher up in the social hierarchy, whatever the hierarchy is that is relevant for the particular situation, will have more persuasive power than people lower on the hierarchy. So, for example, in the, in the context of a university, a professor's opinion may be perceived as more important than the opinion of one student. Or, you know, in families, uh, parents can persuade their children to clean their rooms, but it doesn't really work as well in the opposite direction. So uh, kids may have a hard time persuading their parents to, to, to do some cleaning. So what this means is that our roles and positions are also dependent on the context. Now, expertise is another attribute that changes with the context. So each person can be an expert on some issues, but probably not on all issues. And others know this, so they can perceive us as experts on some topics, and they will listen to what we have to say there, but they probably won't do that with, a, with respect to any topic. So when we try to persuade someone about something, uh, we will probably be more persuasive when we talk about a topic that we have some level of expertise in, at least. For example, uh, I told you in the beginning of this lecture that I'm a linguist, and because of this, I can be considered an expert on language and communication, but not on topics like organic chemistry or playing the cello. And notice here that it doesn't really matter if I play the cello in real life or not. I mean, it could be that I play three hours a day, but as long as you don't perceive me as an expert on cello, I will have a hard time persuading you about how to start playing the cello, for example. So the point is that as long as you don't know much about me, and you have just sort of uh, accepted me in, in a one particular role, this role does not make me a good source on every topic, but maybe only on the topic which you feel is relevant. In other words, perceptions of the source of a message are crucial to how persuasive the message can be. So, how is this effect of source visible in the context of climate change? Let's look at one example of a study that tested this. A pretty recent study by Bolson, Palm and Kingsland examined the impact of the perceived source of a message, and the wording perceived source is crucial here, on a uh, how effective the message was in making people concerned about climate change. So in this study, uh, they ran an online experiment with thousands of participants in the US, where the participants read a text that was an appeal to action against climate change. And the appeal promoted energy efficiency and renewable energy to substantially decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, after reading the text, the participants filled out a questionnaire about their views on climate change, 
and they were also asked to rate how concerned they are about climate change. Now, crucially, because this was an experiment, they divided the participants randomly into different groups. And in this case, it was actually five groups. And each group of participants read a slightly different text. More specifically, uh, the texts were ascribed to different sources. So for one of the groups, the source of the appeal was said to be a group of climate scientists. For another group, it was said to be a group of US military leaders. For another group of participants, it was said to be a group of democratic politicians. For another, a group of Republican politicians. And for the last group, there was no source explicitly mentioned in the text. Otherwise, the texts were completely identical. Now, what do you think happened? Did the source of the appeal have an effect on how concerned the participants were about climate change after reading the text? And if so, um, which of the sources do you think had the largest impact on people's views? And whose appeal would you take the most seriously? And how do you think the American public reacted? You can pause the video here again just for a bit and think about this and maybe also again jot down a few thoughts and then press play again when you're ready. So what happened was this. Americans were the most concerned about climate change after reading an appeal from military leaders or Republican politicians. Now, if you guessed this one right, then yeah, you can pat yourself on the back. I guess that means you have a pretty good intuition about what, what's going on among the US public. But really what is the most alarming thing about the results of this study is that those participants who read the appeal that was attributed to climate scientists actually rated climate change as a less serious problem than what participants that read any of the other texts did, including the text where no source was mentioned. So this means that the, that the appeal from the people who have the most expertise on the subject had the least persuasive impact on Americans. So, you know, this just shows that, that when it comes to how persuasive someone is, expertise is definitely not everything. And what sometimes matters more is how the source is perceived in terms of their underlying motives and values. And really, this is also taken together sort of a, quite a good explanation of the very different reactions people have to someone like Greta Thunberg. Um, it's really just all about perceptions. Okay, so now I've talked about the source of the message for quite a while, so let's move on to the next factor that should affect our choice of what to say when persuading someone. So let's talk about the recipient or the audience to our message. In the same way that we said that it's important to be aware of our own role in a given situation, it is equally important to be aware of the role or the position of the other person or groups of people in that situation. The primary audience of this lecture, for example, are university students and therefore I'm choosing what to say and uh, how much detail I give about certain things um, based on my assumptions of what you may know or what would be maybe good for you to know or what you might find interesting and so on. 
And this is uh, quite a difficult task, um, as is any act of communication to a large number of people, because there is so much variety between students and between different people. They're all, all a bit different, right? They, they have different interests, they have different opinions, they have different personalities, and there's just no one-size-fits-all way of communicating. And so there is also no one-size-fits-all way of persuasion. In a way, that's a bit unfortunate, because when it comes to global problems like climate change, we would really like there to be like a universal way of talking about it uh, that would make everyone immediately uh, get on board uh, and get on the same page and, and pull together for solving to the problem. But yeah, as you've probably noticed, uh, that's not the case. And that's not really a fault of how scientists or the media communicate about climate change, although we, we also shouldn't let them off the hook completely. But, but it's more the fact that the audience is so diverse and there are so many different motives that we can find among the audience. So one of the main characteristics of the recipient that has an impact on how effective a persuasive message can be are the core values of the recipient. Ideally, uh, when people receive some new information, they would reflect on it in a balanced and objective way before reaching some conclusions. But in reality, as you're probably aware, people often first reach the conclusions which they prefer, and then they sort of cherry pick the things from the new information that fits into those conclusions. Uh, Matthew Hornsey, who is uh, um, a professor at the University of Queensland, and he's one of the world's, world's leading researchers on science communication today, um, he uses a, a pretty nice metaphor, I think, to, to, to describe this phenomenon. He talks about cognitive lawyers. So he says that people's minds are like lawyers who have already picked a side in a case, and then they pick the information that supports their case, and they ignore and even try to maybe discredit the evidence for the opposite side. He also uses another metaphor, which I really like, uh, when he talks about the beliefs and opinions people have and their willingness to change these beliefs. So he compares them to a tree where the individual beliefs and attitudes and opinions, those are the visible part of the tree. But all these visible parts, they are based on a much more sturdy part on a much more longer part, which uh, Matthew calls the attitude roots, meaning the worldview and the identity and the interest and the ideology that people have. And the roots determine what kind of leaves can grow out of the branches. So in other words, what kind of information sticks or what kind of information an individual accepts. So to give a specific, a specific example of the effect of the attitude roots um, in the context of climate change, Troy Campbell and Aaron Kay made a study where they looked at how different messages influence people's opinions about climate change depending on the underlying worldview or the different attitude roots that people have. Now, as you may know, in the US, uh, worldviews are pretty heavily tied to people's political ideology. So um, Republicans tend to have a conservative worldview that emphasizes individualism and free market ideology. And they tend to also be higher on the social dominance orientation scale. So they consider uh, hierarchies as, as something um, basically positive. 
And Democrats, on the other hand, are more for some degree of government involvement in the public life uh, in forms of regulation, taxation, and so on. And they are also more for equal opportunities uh, in that they are lower on the social dominance orientation scale. So Campbell and Kay made an online experiment with randomly selected participants that identified as either Republicans or Democrats. And uh, in the experiment, the participants read a text about the IPCC report, so the climate change report. And uh, the text said that, you know, the, the global temperature will rise substantially if we don't take any measures and that this is very bad for everyone. But crucially, there were two different versions of the text. The first part about the temperature was the same for uh, same in both versions, but then the text differed with respect to, to the rest. So half of the participants in the experiment read one version of the text and the other half read the other version. And I happen to have the texts here. So both texts were reporting on a keynote address by Gary Walson at a climate conference, but they picked on different, different aspects from that speech. For one of the texts, they picked quotes from Mr. Walson that supported government-led solutions to climate change. And for the other text, they picked quotes about solutions that are in agreement with a free market ideology. Now, after the participants had read one of the texts, they were asked about what they think is the likelihood that humans are causing climate change and how strongly they agree with the climate scientists in the IPCC report. Now, you can read through both of these texts on your own and Think about which one of the texts, or the solutions that are mentioned in the texts, you find most persuasive, and which could change your beliefs about climate change. And then try again to put yourself in the shoes of a Republican or a Democrat in the US, and try to guess how they responded to the two questions after reading these texts. You can pause the video now and write down any thoughts and hypotheses that you may have about this, and then press play when you're ready. So what were the results of the experiment by Campbell and Kay? Let's first look at the belief regarding whether humans are causing climate change. Uh, which the participants rated on a scale from 0 to 8. So for Democrats, you can see that no matter which one of the texts they read, they in general more or less agreed that humans are causing climate change. For Republicans, the ratings were lower overall, but more importantly, there was a really big difference between, between those answering this question after they had read the text that was proposing government-led solutions and those that read the text with free market solutions. I mean, look at that. That is like a really big difference. That's pretty incredible, really. Now, we can also have a look at the results concerning the second question, namely whether the participants believe the climate scientists in the IPCC report. And lo and behold, the results look exactly the same. So for, de for Democrats, there was no effect of the text version. But for Republicans, 50% of the participants who read the text with the free market friendly solutions agreed about the facts with the climate scientists, while only about 20% of the participants that read the text with the government led solutions did so. So even belief in science is dependent on how the proposed solutions fit with the attitude roots of people. And this again is just one example out of dozens of similar studies 
showing that when you try to persuade someone about climate change, you should present the facts and the solutions in a way that is in line with the person's worldview and ideology. And that, more generally, when you decide what to say, you should try to think about who your audience is. So be aware of the attitude roots. Okay, let's get back to our drawing of the factors at play in persuasion. So we've talked about the source, and now we've talked about the recipient. So let's say a few words about the context next. I won't go too deep into context here because, well, there are just so many different kinds of contexts and, and so many variables associated with this factor, like uh, ranging from the form of communication we're talking about, uh, like face-to-face -face interaction or videos or tweets to where we are in physical space, like are we at home or outside on the street or in a science lab or, you know, like on holidays on a beach in Hawaii to who else is there to what time of day it is and so on and so on. Just really like every situation is unique in a way. But just to give you an idea of how even the smallest details in the situational context can have a significant effect on our state of mind and on our views of issues like climate change, I'll give one example of a study that looked at these kinds of effects. So there is a great and actually like a pretty funny study by Ryzen and Critcher um, where they asked people in the US to rate to what extent they believe in the theory of human-induced climate change. And the people responded on a scale from 0 to 10. 0 meaning it is a bogus theory, and 10 meaning it's a proven fact. But the crucial manipulation of the experiment was that they gave this rating task to participants in different settings. For example, on a warm, sunny day versus on a cold day. And in an even funnier version of the experiment, uh, they had this, this cubicle indoors where they could regulate the temperature. And then they invited participants inside the cubicle to fill out a questionnaire with lots of different questions, including the one about whether they believe in human-induced climate change. And for some participants, the temperature in the cubicle was kept at a completely normal room temperature. But for other participants, they turned the temperature up so, so that it was noticeably warmer in there. And they found that belief in human-induced climate change was significantly higher among the participants who filled out the questionnaire in the cubicle with the warmer temperature. Meaning that, whether you're aware of it or not, the temperature of the room you are sitting in right now has an effect on your beliefs. And your beliefs, of course, influence what action you choose to take. So this study sort of uh, puts into perspective the, the thing that makes a lot of scientists so frustrated, uh, namely that people have such a hard time separating weather from, from climate, you can see here that our beliefs are not just affected by weather, but also by the even more immediate context of the here and now. And there are really a lot of studies showing these types of effects. And I, actually, I would like to just quickly mention one more similar and also really funny study. This one is by Lewandowski, Cherokko, and Gately where they asked people the, the same type of question as Ryzen and Critcher did, but this time, instead of manipulating the temperature of the setting, they gave half of their par participants mint chewing gum. And you know, mint has this uh, cooling effect on your breath. It doesn't change the temperature, but it, but it gives you a feeling of, of coolness. And just as they expected, 
people who were chewing on the mint chewing gum were less concerned about climate change than what the control group was. So yeah, um, there would be a lot more studies like that to choose from uh, that show similar types of effects. But even just based on these couple of examples, it should be clear that the physical setting and the general context play quite a bit, quite a big part in how we react to different messages and also how persuasive uh, we may find them. Now, let's again get back to this illustration of factors that should influence our choice of what to say. So we've talked about th three of them now, the source, the recipient, and the context. Now, there's actually one more factor that I want to add to this figure, and somebody else could maybe see it as a part of the context. And I guess that would be sort of okay too, but I want to mention it and discuss it separately here because it's so important. And that is language. Now, don't worry, I don't mean language in a narrow sense here, so I won't be talking about correct grammar or correct spelling or whatever, whatever it is that people typically think that linguists care about when they talk about language. What I mean is language in a much broader sense. So not just containing sounds or letters uh, and words and sentences, but also all the other signs that we can produce and that can be interpreted in a certain way by the recipients. Uh, so this includes also facial expressions, gestures, drawings, videos, music, and really everything else that can be used to communicate some meaning to someone else. And I guess I could have called this the method of communication instead of language. But method of communication sounds so abstract, so I like language better. And after all, most of the information content that we produce or receive uh, goes through language. So for persuasion, it is really helpful to know the possibilities as well as the limitations that language has. It is really good to know what tools language provides us with for the purpose of persuasion. Language is a really wonderful and complex thing, and it allows for so much variety in our communication. We can express concepts and actions through language. We can talk about real things and about things we just imagine. We can talk about things that are here and now, and we can talk about things that happened in the past or that will happen in the future to someone else. And we can express feelings with language like fear and joy and anger. And we can affect thoughts with language. So it's really the most amazing thing. But there are also limitations. So for starters, the way that language conveys meaning is pretty imprecise, really. So language isn't like math, where two always means two, and two never means three. Words and expressions in language do not have meanings that are set in stone, but they change with time, and they can also mean different things to different people. This is great uh, in one sense, because it allows language to be so flexible, but it's also a potential pitfall for communication in some cases. For example, I'm sure you've noticed or, or heard this before, but the term theory means very different things to scientists than it does to the general public. Scientists use the word theory to talk about um, an explanation of a, of a large body of empirical evidence. But when the general public hears the word theory, they think of a hunch or just speculation. There, there was a really nice article by Richard Somerville and Susan Hassel a few years ago 
where they discussed how the meanings of certain words like theory are different for scientists and for the quote-unquote regular people. And this difference becomes a problem when scientists try to inform the general public about issues like, ch like climate change. So apart from the term theory, if scientists talk about margin of error in the results of an experiment, what the general public hears is that the scientists have made a mistake. So this list of misunderstood scientific terms is really a good way to illustrate the limitations of language in a way. People can speak the same language, but they can still understand the words very differently. And this gap between scientific English and everyday English makes it difficult for scientists to communicate their findings about climate change in a persuasive way. So I'll let you read through this list on your own now, and you can think about these terms a bit more and maybe also try to think of other terms that may have different meanings depending on who's using them. And also, if your first language is some language other than English, then you can maybe also think of the corresponding words in your own language and whether you see a similar gap of meanings be uh, there between science and everyday language use. So you can pause the video for a minute or so and continue when you're ready again. Now that we're talking about language, um, I want to give one more example of a feature of language that affects the way we can use it to communicate and to persuade others. And that is that language is very metaphorical by nature. What I mean by this is that language is really filled to the brim with metaphors, like the ones I just used filled to the brim, where I was talking about language like it was a container filled with fluid. Well, metaphors like that are really everywhere in language. Like I said before, the fact that we can use words in new contexts is what makes language so flexible. And new contexts usually mean that we're using a word in a slightly new sense. Hence in a metaphorical sense. And metaphors really are necessary for talking about everything that is abstract. So usually, the more abstract a concept is, the more metaphors we use to describe it. There is this really famous book in linguistics called Metaphors We Live By, by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, where they showed that we have a very systematic way of using metaphors in everyday language in that there are a lot of individual metaphors that we use about concepts like love, for example. But many of these individual metaphors stem from the same general underlying idea or view of love as a journey. So we say things like the relationship is back on track or it's been a bumpy road, or we went our separate ways, or the classic, where is this relationship going? And we talk like this as if we were talking about a physical journey. We're using the same words as if we were talking about a journey that we undertake together. The underlying common idea that several individual metaphors share is called a metaphorical frame. Now, there is evidence that using these kinds of metaphorical frames really affects the way we think of the concepts we are talking about. With respect to climate change, which is a concept that is almost as abstract as love, although maybe not quite, there is, for example, a study by Flussberg, Matlock, and Thibodeau, where they compared how using different metaphorical frames affects people's willingness to act in a more environment-friendly way. 
So they divided their participants randomly into three groups, and the different groups read different texts about climate change, where the crucial manipulation concerned the metaphorical framing used in the text. Afterwards, the participants filled out a questionnaire with lots of different questions, but the ones that we are interested, he interested in here are questions like, would you be willing to decrease your use of air conditioning and heating in order to reduce your carbon footprint? Would you be willing to decrease your use of goods and services that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and pollution? And would you be willing to decrease your intake of agricultural products that derive from farming techniques known to contribute to climate change? And the participants indicated their willingness to do these things on a scale from one to five. Uh, in the analyses of these res responses, the ratings to the different questions were then averaged. Uh, so each participant uh, got like one score to indicate their overall willingness to make sacrifices for the environment. Now, the three texts that they used in the, in the experiment are here. All of the texts contain the same facts, but in the first one, efforts to mitigate climate change are described using the metaphorical frame of war, in the second one, the metaphorical frame of a race or a competition. And in the third one, the efforts are described as neutrally as possible, so with no obvious metaphorical frame. I will again let you read these texts on your own. And while you do that, try finding all the metaphors used in the texts and write them down and then think about which metaphorical framing you think is the most effective and what effect you think they had on people's willing willingness to make sacrifices. So you can pause the video here for a few minutes and then press play when you're ready. Okay. So, first of all, you can see that the texts really differed only in terms of a few sentences in the beginning of the text, and then with respect to the last sentence. For the most part, the texts were completely identical. I'll just, uh, I'll just quickly mark the metaphors in the first text here. So you have the war against climate change to combat excessive energy use, kill the problems, countries should be recruited like soldiers uh, to fight this deadly battle, joining the campaign like a war campaign, and then finally the last sentence, this is a war we can't afford to lose. So what do you think? How effective was this metaphorical framing? Well, the results show that it was pretty effective, actually. So comparing the three texts, the average scores for the willingness to make sacrifices was significantly higher for those who read the text with the war framing in comparison with those who read the text with the race framing or the neutral text. Now, I guess it should be said that uh, the difference isn't huge in absolute terms. I mean, when you look at the y-axis here and the scale, you notice that the average scores for the race and the issue groups are around 3.3, whereas they are around 3.4 for the war group. But really, you have to remember here that all that was different in the three texts was a few words in three sentences. Plus, climate change is something that we hear about all the time anyway, so many people have already formed quite, a str quite strong opinions on it. And really, in light of that, it is actually pretty remarkable that a few words can make a difference at all. So, this experiment shows that metaphorical framing 
can be an effective way to persuade people to take action against climate change because it creates certain associations in our minds which can give the issue a sense of urgency or importance. And again, this study is just one of many similar studies that show this effect. So the effect really is quite robust. Okay, so now our diagram or illustration of the different factors that should play into a decision about what to, uh, what to say seems pretty complete. But I promised earlier that I will circle back to the issue of topic choice towards the end of the lecture. So I think um, it is time to do that now. Um, so let's talk a bit more about the choice of what we talk to someone about. It should be obvious by now, um, based on all the other things we've talked about in between, that choosing the topic isn't something we can do uh, in isolation from all the other factors. We, we can't just decide to talk about climate change without also thinking about who our audience is, what context we are in, uh, what role we ourselves have in that context, as well as uh, what we actually can put into words. So the point is that there is an interplay between all these factors. And even though the, the kind of studies and experiments uh, that, I have, uh, that I have presented here isolate the effects of single variables, because uh, that's the way you have to do it in experiments, in reality, the, the variables, of course, work together. So we should choose a topic based on what we know about the intended recipient of our message, while also remembering that uh, uh, the way the recipient perceives us is essential to whether we can be persuasive, uh, a persuasive source on a topic. and that the context or the setting should be appropriate for the topic, um, and so on. So it is a very complicated picture because, well, yeah, humans are complicated and, and communication is complicated as well. Having said that, we have seen that there are some communication strategies that seem, seem to have a pretty, so, a pretty solid persuasive effect on people. Uh, we've, uh, we've already talked about uh, metaphorical frames, uh, and we've also talked about arguments uh, that fit into the worldview of the intended audience, uh, for example. So these seem like good strategies, but are there other good strategies? Um, we won't have the time to talk about all of these, uh, of course. Um, there's a lot of research uh, around on different kinds of strategies that you, you can use, uh, but I do want to uh, give just a couple of more uh, examples of strategies that, that seem quite promising with respect to climate change communication. Uh, and I will give you some examples of studies where these effects have been shown. One of the most well-researched fields of, um, uh, of social psychology uh, overall is the effect of social norms. Social norms um, refer to what is customary behavior within a social group. Uh, basically, um, it means that when we see that uh, everyone in our social circle does a certain thing, uh, we will likely do it too. So to give a trivial example, in many countries, uh, when you go to a restaurant, you tip the waiter and everyone does this. In other countries, like in Finland, for example, it is not really that common to tip 
Uh, so maybe you do it in some special cases, but most people don't tip in restaurants. Now there are reasons uh, for why uh, there is this difference in in the customs of the of the country uh, and we don't need to go into that here but what i'm getting at here is that there are social norms that we follow in our everyday lives so how can social norms be applied to persuasion and to persuasion about climate change specifically well um if we know that everyone else thinks that climate change is bad, and if we know that everyone else is using their bikes to go to work, uh, then we will be more inclined to go by bike too. I'll give just one example here of an experiment which, uh, which I thought was really fascinating when I first read about it. And that's an experiment about how people uh, behave in hotels. So, you know, when you go to a hotel, you, you usually get like several towels of different sizes in your room. Now, it used to be so that uh, when you stayed more than one night in a room, uh, they would automatically change your towels every day um, because it's like nice to have a fresh towel every day. But nowadays, uh, what most hotels do in their effort to be more um, environment friendly is that they put a sign in the bathroom saying that if you want the cleaning person to change your towel you should leave it on the bathroom floor but if you don't mind uh, keeping the same towel for another day uh, you can leave it hanging somewhere so what about if the message on the sign in the bathroom would make a reference to a social norm would that have an effect on the towel behavior, in quotes, uh, of, the, of the hotel guests? Well, uh, this is what Noah Goldstein, Robert Cialdini and Vladas Griskevicius tried to find out in their experiment. So they, they made a deal with a large hotel with hundreds of rooms that they could put different kinds of signs in different rooms um, and then simply count the rate at which the guests reuse the towels depending on what sign they had in their bathroom. At first uh, they used two different signs. Um, the first one said help save the environment. Uh, you can show your respect for nature and help save the environment by reusing your towels during your stay. And then followed uh, by instructions on where you can leave the t uh, where you can leave the towels and so on. Uh, the other version of the sign said the same thing, but in addition, it also included the following text: "Join your fo fellow guests in helping to save the environment." Almost seventy five percent of guests who are asked to per to participate in our new resource savings program do help by using their towels more than once. You can join your fellow guests in this program to help save the environment by, re by reusing your towels during, during, <laughs> during your stay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So this text informs the guests that there is a social norm to reuse the towels, since a clear majority of people do it. I think you can probably already guess what the results of this were, because I probably wouldn't be talking about this study if there weren't any effects, right? So this is what they found. Uh, the guests that had the first sign in their bathroom reused the towels 35% uh, of the time. The guests that had the sign mentioning the social norm in their bathroom, uh, they reused the towels 44% of the time, which based on the numbers of the rooms and the study was a very significant difference. So just by informing the guests about there being a social norm, 
which is not something that the guests can really easily verify for themselves. So they, so they just have to take this information at, at face value. The, the rate of reusing the towels increased by 9%. So that's pretty cool. But there's more. So after doing this experiment, uh, the researchers decided to try out the effectiveness of a few more signs, of a few more versions of the sign. And one of these versions uh, was almost identical to the, to the second sign with the, with the information about the social norm. But this one said, in a study conducted in fall 2003, 75% of the guests who stayed in this room, and then they added the specific room number of the room in question, participated in our new resource savings program by using their towels more than once. Now, by making the small change to the message, they managed to reach a towel reuse rate of 49% which was, again, a significant increase in comparison to the previous signs. So just by specifying the social norm and making it specifically about the context where the individual hotel guest is at that very moment they are reading the sign, they managed to encourage eco-friendly behavior by a very notable amount. And this brings us quite nicely uh, to another field of research that I still wanted to mention, and that uh, current uh, research and communication about climate change has been occupied with quite a bit. Namely, that messaging becomes more effective the more local it is. The problem with climate science from a communication and persuasion perspective is that it is a global phenomenon. Now, that makes it uh, scary in terms of its scope, but it, but it also makes it pretty vague from the perspective of an individual. So when scientists talk about the average global temperature, and the average global temperature rising, that really does not have much persuasive effect on an individual who, of course, is not all over the world uh, uh, at once, but uh, who is living uh, their life in one specific location. And uh, in the same way, like showing images of starving polar bears, isn't probably the most effective communication strategy, not because people don't care about polar bears when they see those images, but because most of them don't care about polar bears during the remaining 99.9% .9 of their day when there are no images of polar bears in sight. Polar bears are a symbol of the global impact of climate change but most people live their lives very locally, and they think locally. So they want to know what changes might be coming to their own surroundings, because those surroundings, those surroundings affect their lives, um, not just the 0.1% of the day, but all the time. So if we make our message about how climate change is going to change the specific surroundings of our audience, they are more likely to be persuaded by that message, and they might conclude that, that something should be done. On a theoretical level, speaking about local instead of global effects of climate change is a way to reduce the psychological distance between an individual and the problem that they are facing. So um, maybe you know that psychological distance is a concept um, within the construal level theory in psychology, and it refers to how far uh, some event 
seems to be from us um, in terms of uh, time and space and con consequence. So, so I guess uh, another way to put it is how affected we feel by an event. In relation to this, um, the, the last study uh, really that I'm, I'm going to quickly present in this lecture is a recent paper by Laura Loy and Alexis Spence where they tried looking at the link between psychological distance and people's willingness to engage in pro-climate behavior. So they ran an online experiment in the UK where they had uh, participants uh, read a news text, a news story about the future consequences of climate change either in the UK, meaning consequences with a low psycholo psychological distance to the participants, or consequences in Bangladesh, meaning effects that seem far away, so, so effects with a large psychological distance. Now, um, they actually measured the psychological distance using a psychological questionnaire that the participants filled out after reading one of the two texts, so they could quantify how close or far, or, or far away the problems in the UK or Bangladesh felt to the participants. And then, at the end of the online questionnaire, uh, the participants were told that there are these, uh, uh, these new climate initiatives uh, to reduce the effects of climate change and that if they like, they can get more information uh, about these initiatives by clicking on the links that were provided there. So what the researchers then measured, uh, what was sort of like the uh, dependent measure in the experiment was how many uh, links uh, the the um, participants clicked on and how much time they spent on reading uh, the information that was behind these links. Um, and then they looked at whether these measures correlated with the measure of psychological distance. And as you would expect, it did. So the lower the psychological distance was, uh, that the participants felt to the events described in the news story, uh, the more interested they were in finding out uh, what they could do to help in the effort to uh, effort against climate change. So the more time they spent uh, on these on these sites that were describing the climate initiatives, and um, um, yeah. On, on, the, on the other hand, the higher the psychological distance, the less engaged uh, people were. But Loy and Spence made another manipulation of the experiment where another set of participants also read the news story about Bangladesh. But before they did that, they were shown a short video um, where a man uh, was dancing with people from all over the world. The theory behind this uh, was that the video could make the participants feel connected with humanity as a whole, which in turn would lower the psychological distance between things happening in Bangladesh and the participants in the UK. And it really did. So the conclusions that Loy and Spence make from their study um, are basically that local messages are always effective, but even global messages can be effective if people are primed to think of themselves as part of the global community first. So what this means is that scientists don't need to stop talking about global effects of climate change, but that they should preface these results first by appealing to people's sense of a common cause and connectedness with other people. And I think this is also a good way to conclude the lecture. So with a hopeful global message. So what we've done here 
in this lecture is that by looking at different examples of studies on communication about climate change, we've actually sketched an entire model of persuasive communication. We've talked about the, uh, the factors that a model of persuasion includes and that need to be taken into account when planning a communication strategy. So the topic, the source, the context, the audience, and the language we use. And we've talked about the complex interplay between these factors. A lot more could be said about each of these things, and a lot more could be added to the model, but this is a good start. So what I hope is that you feel inspired and that you will see stories and messages about climate change in a slightly new light the next time you encounter them. On that note, I wish you have a great day uh, in which you manage to persuade someone about something, something good.